Hi everybody, I'm Brent Stafford and welcome to another edition of Reg Watch on GFN.TV. We're here in Warsaw, Poland for the Global Forum on Nicotine GFN 22 and I'm here with Dr. Ernest Groman. Hello. Hello, you're from Austria, Professor of Public Health at Medical University of Vienna in Austria and Scientific Director of the Nicotine Institute. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, wow, I think you're my first interview with somebody from Austria and, you know, huge history uh, there. To be honest, we have a broken history because we had this empire which broke down and uh, it stayed the capital of the empire <laughs> and all the bureaucracy, but no, nothing to... <laughs> To, uh, so you kept all the bureaucracy? Yeah, of course, of course, yeah, <laughs> but, we did, but <laughs> there was very little to, to uh, organize. Well, it's well. fascinating because, I mean, obviously for centuries, a lot of medical innovations came out of Austria. Uh, yes, medical school, Austrian or Viennese medical school was very famous throughout the world and we, we did many innovations. And, but it also has to do with the communication. Uh, you have to imagine this was also a very broad market with, with all the connected uh, countries with uh, Slovakia, Czechia, Hungary, parts of, of Ukraine even, so to say, the eastern part. So, so the market was bigger and therefore the communication was also better. And, to be honest, it was also more important for industry because uh, if you have a big market, now, nowadays we have the small market and even when we look at our projects, we are quite successful, but of course we have a capital of 8 million people and even if you double or triple as successful compared to Germans or Germany, it, it doesn't matter so much. Describe for us um, your focus on nicotine. Yeah. Why is that? Well, it happened. I have never planned it. Uh, I was working in hospital and then I was specializing in a little project at the Public Health Institute. And my former head, uh, Professor Kunze, he, he set up an outpatient clinic and I was sitting there with the smokers. And I realized it's difficult with them because uh, I said, do this, do that. And usually as a medical doctor, you are used to patients not exactly doing what you tell them, but here it was completely different. And then we found out that this was a time of nicotine replacement of nicotine gums. And at that time it was forbidden to continue smoke according to product information if you used nicotine gum. And we found out we had patients, they used I say five nicotine gums per day and smoked uh, 20 cigarettes instead of 40. And then was the question, what to do with them? Usually when you were going according to product information, you, you would have had to tell them, stop nicotine gum, continue with smoking. And we realized there is some, some, uh, something missing or some like risk reduction, harm reduction. And uh, we also did the, in Austria, the first publications on, on harm reduction. We called it alternative nicotine delivery systems at the time in the uh, 1998 uh, was the first publication. You're describing dual use uh, yes. of, of smoking yes. and, and nicotine gum yes. back in the late 90s. Yeah, yeah. And even course. then that was an issue from critics. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. And, uh, but you have always that theory where people develop some construct and then you suddenly, if you do it, you are confronted with reality. And I'm always uh, interested what happens in real life, not what some academic ideas you develop. As my, my Professor Kunze once told me, it's better to talk about it, not seeing it, what really happens. But if you really want to get the knowledge, which can be a pain if you realize these very exact models in reality, it looks quite different, it does not work that way. Help me understand, is there a difference say in the field in Austria, say opposed to the US or the UK or Canada, where it seems that public health, the bureaucrats, have lost their mind over vaping. When you look at the difference, uh, maybe it has also some, I'm not an expert here, maybe it's also the religious background, you know, Protestants are very yes, no, black, white, in my opinion, I apologize if I'm wrong. Of course, 
if you are Catholic, you can consider your sins and say, I'm sorry, I, and you get forgiveness. And maybe this is also in the field of drugs. If you use little nicotine or little cigarettes, it might be okay. So it's not so black and white, it's more gray, and maybe it's easier for us. Because most people nowadays uh, agree if you cut down from uh, 40 cigarettes to 10, it's a positive thing to do and do not and you need not to be punished, but you, you deserve some positive emotion that you are doing it. And maybe we also found out that people who were able to reduce uh, make quit attempts then because they have a first success and then they eventually uh, in 20, even if they didn't discuss it before, to say, well, maybe I tried to quit completely. And the same here is with vaping. Here we have the issue in Austria, this restriction of communication. Because, of course, we public health people, we can talk about, but uh, we lack the significant budgets to do it. And, and if the, the industry is not allowed to do it, who should, who should inform the people? Of course, I do not talking about big advertisement saying uh, take this, take that, but, but uh, good scientific information for the people. Because otherwise, for example, I like the examples of real life. I have a neighbor who is using uh, e-cigarettes since four years. He also tells me he saves money. And last time, together at home, I met him. And we met a lady who does some deliveries. And she, she told him, ah, you're using e-cigarettes. It's as harmful as cigarettes. And I told no, it isn't. And so he also always, as there is a lack of information, he always has to defend himself for doing it, which is bad. So we, we need a communication and we, we, we also have this bureaucratic way we have to overcome, which makes rules for the people and otherwise they, they obey or they don't. And if they don't, so we, we have also similar situation in Austria, eventually to the US sometimes, but maybe it's easier to overcome it. Is there retribution from the government or the public health agencies if you don't follow their instructions? Sometimes it's good uh, the, that the population does not care <laughs> to, to say they do what they want and if they realize, for example, if you are a smoker with COPD and you take uh, nicotine pouches or, or e-cigarettes and you realize it gets better, yeah, then you will continue. But is that actually real science? I mean, can, do, I, we find that the critics don't take that seriously. You could line up a hundred people who had COPD and will testify to the fact that their vaping has eased that, you know, horrible medical issue for them. But yet it seems that the critics don't take that into any account. Uh, no, well, of course, I guess you always can say we need additional studies to prove it. And uh, of course, we need long-term observation, but long-term ob observations here are also a killer argument because usually uh, you cannot say we, do not, we, we, we should not use e-cigarettes because in, we do not know what will happen in 30 years. You never know it in any innovation. So also, we have many new, new medications in medicine. And how should I know what happens with a person 30 years later? Uh, so I, the, it was really enemies of innovation uh, who who reject this, and uh, so and so we, we must come from the momentary point of science, which is okay. If I reduce the substances in it, then hopefully it also reduces the risk. And it would be quite logical that this happens. And we know nicotine at itself is a relatively harmless substance. Of course, it's addictive, but... Is it harmful? And it's relatively harmless, yeah, of course. And as an, another question would be, uh, humans have always used psychoactive substances as soon as they realize to improve their mood. Uh, what would people use instead? So sometimes this... Uh, Smoking, abolitionism, also this, this smoking uh, activists, they simply focus on smoking. So, and I would say, from all the psychoactive uh, substances easily available, 
it might be comparable from the risk to caffeine and we do not talk about caffeine, we just say how bad nicotine is and it's completely wrong, it's the delivery system. You know, when you have heard before here, I guess, <laughs> about you, if you burn the cigarette, you, you produce, depending on the measurements, uh, 20 years ago we said 5,000 substances, 30 carcinogens, nowadays it's 75 carcinogens. Of course you have the question, to what concentration is the amount of carcinogens relevant? But uh, if you do not burn the tobacco, you, you save a lot uh, of these uh, substances and usually you can reduce it to two or three and it would be quite unlogical if this wouldn't improve the health of the people. And a second issue is, I always say we, we did this uh, question in Austria several times, we have, of our smokers, we have a smoking rate of approximately 25 to 30 percent. So we have a high smoking rate and, uh, and approximately 60 uh, percent of them, they, they are not willing to quit or they cannot quit. And uh, we, 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 we must not leave them alone. Uh, we, we have to do something, offer them something, some substitution that they can choose. Can you choose to vape nicotine in Austria? Uh, yes, e-cigarettes are available, but uh, there are restrictions because it's regulated according to tobacco law, which is a pity because uh, the base on this was the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in 2002 and no alternative products have been available at the time, so we didn't, I have been there, we didn't even consider it, besides of nicotine replacement, of course. Are there independent shops selling vaping devices and e-juice and all that? Yeah, there was some uh, conflict there because we have our tobacconists, which are traditional uh, shops, usually uh, veterans from the war who got some disability, uh, got them, who sell tobacco products. And then we have these uh, little vendors and there was a conflict even at the court, but the court decided even these little uh, vendors can sell e-cigarettes. What about the kids? Are the kids all hooked on vaping in Austria? Uh, I, we do not see many children. We have no good data on it, I have to say, honestly. Maybe we should invest. Is the media scare uh, in Austria focused on the kids? Uh, yes, always. It's always the, it's, it's the killer argument and it's, it's like you tell people, so if you do not start, you do not have to stop. Yeah, this is quite logical, but if it's the same, if someone, you know, we have many mountains in Austria, if someone falls down the mountain, if he wouldn't have climbed it, he could not fall down. So, yeah, but it's, it's a kick. The, the, the young people are a real killer argument if you want to do something. And uh, we, we did different projects also with schools and they were more or less successful, but honestly, nobody, and nobody can tell me, he knows exactly how he can prevent that young people start to smoke. The only thing we really found was the price of cigarettes. So we found that high prices prevents, we also did a new study now here and published it. So, for our, you can find it uh, for free on the internet, best things in life are free. <laughs> and we see if the prices are high, uh, then uh, it prevents young people uh, starting uh, to smoke. So we're here at the Global Forum for Nicotine. Have you ever been to one of these events in person? I have been at this event, I think it was before the pandemic and enjoyed it very much really because I have never seen uh, this dynamic before and also these consumer groups, it was not existent before, really, it was, I, I was really impressed because, uh, so to say, it, it was nothing in Austria at least, less cool than going to a pharmacy and buying nicotine gum. But now you, we have these dynamics that people, especially with e-cigarettes, they have, some of them have a, even a speci specific way how they use their clothes. And it seems to, at first I was not sure if this is good or bad, but when you, when you look at the acceptance, it's good that the, 
that it develops in this direction, of course. Have you noticed that within the debate over uh, nicotine and the war on vaping, yeah. that there's a, quite a bit of a process going on where researchers and so forth are getting shunned from within inside the community? Uh, yes, we see this witch hunting, which is something which is really, I'm not sure if this is the right word, it's regrettable, it's shameful. Uh, people uh, for exposing people who have a different opinion, it's also undemocratic, so to say, especially problematic in a country like Austria or Germany. You, you have to hear the other side before. And uh, simply, especially these activist messages, uh, sometimes, for example, tobacco industry is bad because it sells cigarettes. Oil industry is bad because it produces oil. You can, nutrition industry has sugar, so it's bad. So, so you do not need to know a lot to, to do this work here. And it's so simplifying and so, so banal sometimes. And then saying, yes, and this person, I'm sure he took some money from somewhere. So you should not look if he took some money from someone. You should look at his work and what he has said. And was it reasonable? Was he right? Was he wrong? And then you can discuss. If it's wrong, you can say maybe he was influenced in an improper way. It seems that they believe that research that is funded by uh, industries that they disagree with is biased, whereas if it's funded by the government, mm -hmm. then it, and it's okay, it's pure as gold, right? Like they, I find that these critics never take a look at any of the research that's turned out by the national systems. Well, I would say, yeah, I do not speak in my case now, but governmental fund is also very politically influenced, especially what is mainstream at the moment. And uh, when you look at medicine, to be honest, without industry and industry research, we would have, we still would be on aspirin, you know, <laughs> and there would be no new medications. And uh, yeah, I would be, say, I'm not a fan of capitalism, but it's the thing, it's, it's the way things work today and, and how you can raise capital for different, and you also have the risk. And for example, uh, we did a very big thing on smoking information uh, with our chambers of pharmacists. And it, I guess it was even the biggest thing in maybe Central Europe. And there was some critics and there was at the government department who said, yes, give me public money. I'm happy to do it with public money. So, uh, we, but there is no, so, so some things even would, would not take place if you do not get some funding for some, from some industry or something. So, yeah. My opinion on this after all these years covering this issue is that yeah. public money comes with its own set of biases. Yeah. That the critics of vaping products never seem to consider at yeah. all, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this last question. What do you see in the next couple of years when it comes to, you know, this war on nicotine? Is, it going, is there a path in which that this is going to ease up? Uh, well, it might not ease up. There might be even more polarization. But at the end of the day, it depends what the people do. And uh, I guess the people will decide. And you cannot restrict the information for all the time. But it, it might need longer time if we are not able to tell uh, the, the, the truth. Yeah? Yeah? And if we are not able to communicate it. But people, I guess in the end, they will find out. Yeah? As they found out with smoking, because when you look at cigarette smoking, maybe and I guess also every, maybe every family has someone who suffered from smoking. You do not discuss it openly, then you say it was the stress, but behind it, yes, you know, he also smoked 60 cigarettes per day and it didn't help him. So, but maybe it needs longer. And I, I see this development, which we have seen in Sweden, where people come to a surprisingly low smoking rate, and of course they consume snus and nicotine pouches. And 
I still have some moral issue because we have been in favor of the lifting of this news ban 20 years ago and I always think maybe we could have nowadays a very similar development like Sweden maybe not 5% but maybe 15% of smokers and how many lives could have been saved if there wouldn't be some moralists or people who didn't dare to speak up in some institutions because someone told me I don't need the institution honest, I know you're right, but I won't stick my neck out here. I have a good position and I want to keep it. How many lives could we have saved if we were able to uh, implement this in Europe in a proper way?